I've experienced sexual assault, I've experienced domestic violence, I've experienced poverty, I've had some physical situations as well, but I'm thankful for those challenges. And the reason is, is because when you are weak, he is strong. And so because of all those challenges, I got closer to God. I had a chance to sit down outside Calgary, Alberta, and listen to Holly Fortier tell her story. As a proud First Nation, Holly describes the historical trauma her mother had to endure, and how Holly has overcome the pain, abuse, and racism because of hope. The background to your story is, is very important for us to understand. In fact, you've described your story as breakdowns and breakthroughs. And so to begin, I want to read a statement that you made and I'd like you to comment on just the first part of this statement and I'm going to read it and I quote it states I am an indigenous person telling our story but with no anger or bitterness and I would totally attribute that to my faith I feel God has healed me from the hurt and the anger so Holly you said I am an indigenous person telling our story what makes you proud of your First Nation heritage? I love being First Nation because it is a rich culture. We are the first in the nation. There's a whole beautiful history of our connection to the land, living on the land, um, you know, our connection to all the natural environment and air, land, water, fish, fowl, wildlife. We're so connected to that. And also there is historical trauma. There's a lot of things that we have gone through that I realize that we are so resilient. We are so determined. We've made it through so much. And it makes me so proud of our people that we did all that. Okay, the second part of that statement says, and I quote, but with no anger or bitterness, and I would totally attribute that to my faith, Mm -hmm. I feel God has healed me from the hurt mm -hmm. and the anger. We're going to talk about your faith in just a moment. But the word residential is key to your story. And it begins with your mother. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me, what did your mother have to go through as an indigenous little girl growing up? She had a beautiful life. She was very loved. She remembers lots of laughter, lots of good food, like whole natural food, um, lots of affection, lots of good stories, lots of good instruction, good role modeling. But the government of Canada issued a policy that said, um, we are gonna open up 134 Indian residential schools in Canada. They were operated by four churches, and it was the RCMP that started to go to the families and take the children from them. They took her and her two sisters. My mom was six, my auntie was eight, the little auntie was four. The three little girls went and left, and they were taken to Gruard Indian Residential School. My mom spent the next 13 years at Gruard Indian Residential School. So they were no longer allowed to contact home and home had no idea where they went. She was totally cut off from her culture and her family. At Gruard Indian Residential School, my mother ex experienced extreme neglect and abuse, which is very typical of residential school survivors. And the reason we call them survivors is because 50% of the children that were apprehended from their families and communities never made it. And if you survived, 90, 90% of residential school survivors ended up with a mental illness, depression, anxiety, addictions to more severe forms. So when my mom was 18, her funding ran out. So they get a bus ticket out. She had never left the mission. And when she got to the streets of Edmonton, could you imagine being dumped off in the middle of the city? She said, we had no hope. 
Most of those little kids that got dumped up on the streets after residential school ended up as skid row casualties. With that background, what was it like then for Holly growing up as an Indigenous little girl? So when my mom got off on the streets of Edmonton, she was really fortunate because she met my dad. And those two had a great love story. Love healed my mom, and he soaked us in the culture. So growing up, we became very proud of our First Nation culture. We really embraced it. But I experienced a lot of racism. I had people making fun of me, and it wasn't just children in the neighborhood, it was teachers, adults, other people, and there was a lot of racism in my life. Kids would say, oh, she's gonna scalp us. I had a teacher call me a wagon burner. But here's the thing, I would go and say to my mom, these kids are making fun of me because I'm, you know, Indian. And she would say, never mind. You know what I went through in Indian residential school? And because my mom didn't have a voice, at Indian Residential School because when she left Fort Mackay, she didn't speak a word of English, but when she got to residential school, they were not allowed to speak their language. They were punished. So for years, my mother couldn't even communicate, not even with the little sisters. Indigenous people are very spiritual. So growing up, was there any connection to any kind of a spiritual root that you can talk about? So I really strongly believe, and, I, and we really take a lot of pride in this, that Indigenous people don't separate the spiritual world from the natural world. And so that we, it's very rare that you meet an Indigenous person who's an atheist. We have a strong belief in Creator because our, land, our culture is very connected to creation. And so we have that really strong um, presence. But because of what my mom had gone through, we really did not like the church because of what happened to the church-run Indian residential school. So I kind of didn't want anything to do with it. We were afraid of it. Um, the church represented the neglect and the abuse that our people had gone through. So Holly, what, what First Nation are you from? I'm from Fort Mackay First Nation in Northern Alberta, and we are Cree and Dene. Cree and Dene. Cree and Dene. Is that two different First Nations combined? Yes, yes, yes. What's the difference between the two? A lot of difference. Languages, culture, everything, right? So one of my grandparents was Cree, the other one was Dene. Okay. And Dene go right across Northern Canada, and Dene are North America's largest Indigenous group. There's 634 First Nations in Canada and about 60 different language groups. Did the name Jesus ever, did you ever hear the name Jesus? Did Jesus ever become a part of Holly's growing up as far as maybe storytelling that was told to her? I have some adopted grandparents who are from the Stony Nakoda Nation and they were ministers. And we had a camp out there and we put teepees up and we rode horses. We spent most of our summers and a lot of times, you know, even in the winter out there. And it was just our family going out there. And it was really amazing because they knew scripture so well that they connected it to, you know, the natural environment. So they would explain something, but they would give an indigenous point of view on it to make it more applicable to us. So they were the ones that really helped me understand um, how an Indigenous person can be a Bible-believing Christian. And so they were the perfect examples, and they were beautiful examples, they were beautiful people, and they embrace both of those worlds. So let me, let me fast forward. Mm -hmm. You're 19 years of age, attending Mount Royal University right. in Calgary, Alberta, and it's Christmas. Mm -hmm. Now, strangely enough, at that time, something happens in the bathroom with Holly <laughs> yeah. that changes her life forever. Yeah. Explain that to us. It was Christmas time and I had a house guest when I was going to university and he was from Australia and he had just come from Bible school and he was visiting family here and um, I could hear him in the bedroom in the mornings, uh, you know, behind his closed door 
and he would be in the bedroom and he would be like singing and praying and stuff and he would come out and finally I had you know got enough courage to ask him like what are you doing in there and he goes I'm talking to God and he so gently explained to me about what it meant for him to invite Jesus into his life and how that was transforming his life it was really beautiful you know the thing is is sometimes you're going to be the only Bible that some people are going to be read. And he showed me what it was like to be a Christian. He was so gentle and he was so kind and so peaceful. So it was Christmas, it was busy. So I went into the washroom and I said, you know, whatever that guy has, I want it. In the bathroom that day, I said, if you could come into my life, and I remember saying, and shine the light on all those dark places, I invite you, Jesus, to take over and be Lord. I walked out of that bathroom and it was like the lens had shifted. It was a totally different view I had of the world after that. It was beautiful. It reminded me again of my grandparents being so gentle and being so kind. I was like, now I get it. Now I get what they were doing. So there was a change that happened. Yeah. Inside home. Yes. Absolutely. That moment when, when you made that commitment, because of your past, the hurt and the pain, resentment and anger, was Holly free at that moment or was there a journey she had to take? Don't you wish that when we accept Jesus in our life, we are in heaven right now? We're still here and we have to go through the crushing, the pressure, the pruning, the struggles, the disappointments, the hurts. We have to go through all that. And you know, honestly, if I'm gonna be really vulnerable, I've gone through so many different things in my life. Like I've experienced uh, sexual assault, I've experienced domestic violence, I've experienced poverty. Um, you know, mental health issues as far as depression, anxiety, um, physical, I've had some physical situations as well. And so I really struggle through all those. But I'm thankful for those challenges. And the reason is, is because, you know, I was reading the Bible this morning where it said, when you are weak, he is strong. And so because of all those challenges, I got closer to God because I was like, I need to know your word. So what I did is I became a person who studied the Bible, precept upon precept, and started applying those words to my situation because there is a constant companion. He, I am fully and deeply loved. He goes before me, he's behind me, he's within me, and he empowers me. And you know, I just started to use the word and make it applicable to every situation. So whether it's through the good times or the bad times, I will still seek his face, like all the time. I'm gonna continue praying and serving him no matter what I went through. And so here it is, like all these decades later, life still has its obstacles, but there is one who is still in control. And I choose to look at him and never turn back. Now, did you do that on your own or were there other people that you invited into your life to I walk feel, this journey with you? Yeah, you know, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And I feel that, you know, God will allow things to happen in your life, but he'll also allow people to come in your life to help you through that. So it's really important to surround yourself with people who will be able to speak into your life in a positive way, who can encourage you, um, who love you deeply. And also, you know, iron sharpens iron. People that will say to you, you know, I really want, to, in a loving way, I really want to give you some advice on you need to change this. And so we can't do this alone. We cannot do it alone. So the reason I chose to build a little cottage here is because the land is so special. As I said before, Indigenous people are really connected to the land. And this land is really special to me because, remember I told you about my Stony and Nakota grandparents? And we spent a lot of time, most of my life was on the land with them, and it was just over there. So the foothills of the Rocky Mountains is so precious to me, and I just love the natural environment. Like, look at this view. You know, the Bible says, 
when I look to the mountains and I say, where does my help come from? Our help comes from the creator of those mountains. It's interesting, when you became a Christian, you became a follower of Christ, you said that God was colorblind. Why? You know, in Revelation, the Bible says that um, in the end, around the throne of God, there's going to be every nation, every tribe, every language. He doesn't look at me any different. And here's the sad thing. When I went to church, when I first became a believer, people did not let me accept being indigenous. And I think as a church, we have to stop saying to people either or. Because I can be an indigenous woman and a Christian at the same time. And so I really believe that's important for us to realize, you know, we as a church, we have to stop saying, um, you know, your ethnicity, your origin, your nationality, your tribe, your people, you have to get rid of that because I don't have to. I'm very proud of being a First Nation woman and I am a believer. Canada is a cultural mosaic, but for a long time, Indigenous people were not included. Why not? So when people first came over from Europe, you couldn't live in one of the harshest countries in the world without assistance. The First Nation people really helped because we were like, you know, dude, you need to change up your shoes. Here's your clothing. You're going to get sick if you dress like that here in this harsh country. Also, if you get sick, all of the medicine comes from the land. All of our food sources come from the land. Europeans depended on First Nations. But what happened was, when you know, people first came over uh, with the building of the National Dream, the C Canadian Pacific Railroad, with the fur trade, with the early explorers, the missionaries, the RCMP, when they came over, um, there was battles over the land that took place. So the Government of Canada implemented a policy, it was called the Canadian Indian Act. There were some policies that came under there that were very restrictive. For example, we couldn't go to post-secondary school, so we couldn't, a First Nation person couldn't attend a college or a university. We could not become a business person. We were non-persons. So we didn't really get a voice until 1960. But in that long story, we call ourselves a culture mosaic. We take great pride in Canada. We love that about our nation, saying to every culture, come, we'll, we'll celebrate you. We're all about diversity and inclusion. But what we did to the first people is totally different. What we did is, you know, we were the first people here, but we were the last people in Canada to be recognized as citizens. So I think if Canada understood this, that you know, how we treated our first people, there would be a lot more empathy and understanding and kindness towards us. So a few years ago, the government issued a commission to go across the nation and they interviewed 7,000 survivors who had gone to Indian residential school. They went to 300 communities and they heard every story start to finish. I talked to the three commissioners and I also sat in to hear the people who compiled the reports. And what they did is they, they um, wrote a report and it has 94 calls to action. Canada adopted it and said, we're going to do this the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the 94 calls to action, we're going to make it right with our first people. So now, reconciliation begins. You mentioned the word racism a few times. Today, does that word, do you still struggle with that word? You know, there are people who are racist. Racist is racism. Racism is alive, and I experience it. But the way that I deal with it, I look at the person with pity, and I just think they don't know. And if I can help them, if I can teach them, if I can enlighten them in any way, I will. And if I can't, I'll just brush it off and go my way, because I know that God made me the way that I am, for just a beautiful purpose. And I have a deep calling and I am deeply loved because I am First Nation. 
And because of the woman that I am, I am created in God's image. God knit me together in my mother's womb. I'm created this way, and so I take a lot of pride in it. One final question. Indigenous people are great storytellers. What's Holly doing today to tell their story? So I'm a filmmaker and also I teach Indigenous awareness trainings. I have a business that goes across the nation and I tell people the story of Indigenous people. I talk about our history because in order to move forward, we need to know where we come from. And here's the thing. I've taught thousands and thousands of people, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, but I've had thousands and thousands of people that have said to me, I had no idea. I had no idea. In Canada, we've been really negligent in sharing our story. And I think that healing will begin in our nation when we reconcile with our first people, where we say, let's do this over the, the last 150 years of colonization and unilateral decision making by the federal government, you know, we have built a lot of hurt and resentment between our two cultures. But let's make the one, next 150 better. Let's operate in healing and forgiveness and building that relationship so that it's meaningful and respectful moving forward. When talking about your mother, you mentioned that she had no hope. Define hope for Holly. I really got hope in my life, first of all, when I became a believer and when I started having children. When I looked at my firstborn daughter in the eyes and I thought, oh, I love her so much. She's so beautiful. She's so perfect. It just made me think, this is how God looks at me. And so because of those children, I thought, if I get healed, and I work on myself, I'm pulling them along in the healing with me. My children are all doing really well, and I have three grandchildren now, and they are my hope. They're the reason I do everything. And now I own a business. Um, my children have all gone to university. My daughter is actually practicing Indigenous law. In, she's a lawyer in Calgary. My son is an electrician. My other son just finished his degree in business, and he's living in Amsterdam. And so my three grandchildren are so beautiful and they're so loved. See, we're breaking the cycle, we're changing it. Is Holly healed today? Every day I seek his face. Every morning I wake up and I'm so thankful for the life that I have. I dive into the word, I dive into, you know, listening to worship music, listening to uh, messages online, and just really fellowshipping with people, like what is God doing in your life? And I love that, I love this journey that we're on. Um, you know, there's gonna be things that are gonna come up, there's gonna be more pruning, crushing, disappointments, but I'm so happy that I have a constant companion with me. I'm so thankful for Jesus. Holly, thank you so much for sharing your story with us.